godly man. So the subtitle of this is God builds his kingdom in us. Okay, so I want to just read my paragraph and then we'll read our scripture. Greetings, church family. Say hi. Those of you coming in by camera too. Today we're going to have some revelation knowledge concerning how God establishes his kingdom. Now remember when we say kingdom, it means how he establishes his dominion, his power, and his influence. Everyone say God's dominion, his power, and his influence. So let me take a little time to explain. When God sent Jesus into this earth, he came to redeem and rescue us. Say amen. amen. And he set in motion a kingdom. This kingdom will not fade away. And God is building this kingdom. God has sent us this kingdom. And he wants us to understand how to function and move within the kingdom. Say amen. amen. There are kingdom principles. There are kingdom uh, uh, revelations that he wants us to know. And he says, behold, I give you the kingdom the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Can you say amen? Whatever you bind on earth, bound in heaven, whatever you release on earth. So we know the kingdom has been given to us. So as I explained this, now the word kingdom means dominion. So when Jesus came and walked among us, what did he do? He took dominion. You'll notice only around him were miracles, signs, and wonders happening. Because he brought the kingdom of heaven right on the spot as a human being walking amongst us. He says, the Lord, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus said. And what he was trying to say is, there's a time when the kingdom is going to come, and you're going to walk within my kingdom. Guys, I'm going to change it to carry. Hey, boys, I've got to teach you how to walk within it. I've got to teach you how to pray. I've got to teach you to do these things because these were all foreign to mankind except for the Jews. That's why it says that we are foreigners. We're not citizens like the Jews were. But now we were pilgrims, but now we've been accepted in the beloved and part now in Jesus of the family of God. So we're no longer strangers and foreigners. We are children of light. Someone say amen. amen. So Jesus came down and took dominion. Now what did he do? He died, rose again, purchased us, and then rose again. And then he says, I'm not going to leave you all alone. I'm going to send you my kingdom and my Holy Spirit, and he will guide you into all truth. His job is to teach you to focus on Christ and to walk within the kingdom and his power. Say amen. amen. That's your right and inheritance as a believer. So Jesus set up the dominion. Satan has been stripped of all things but deception. He only has the right to appeal to man's temptations and lusts. He has no right to show up in your living room and slap you around. Amen. Say amen. amen. He has no right to jump on your kids unless your kids are doing something to cause that. See, curses don't come without some kind of cause. This is the New Testament. Can you say amen? So, Jesus took dominion, set up dominion, we have dominion in Christ. But then it's his power. Everyone say power. The Greek tells us there are five Greek words for power. First one is the right to use power. And that is exousia. If you're writing things down. Second is the jurisdiction power of kratos which means you walk in, you bring God, and you're in charge. Now, not out of pride. This is not a prideful thing I'm talking about. Many times I've been in situations where no one knew to pray, no one knew to seek God. I walked in in charge with God and taken authority over it. So everyone say, I have the second power, Kratos. Everyone say, Iskus. Sounds like we're, real, we're having our Greek lesson. Iskus means you have the ability to rest and to cuff and to bind on the spot. Everyone say iskus. Iskus. You make a citizen of heaven's arrest. Now, why did God give these powers to us? So we might use them. 
But the church is too busy being the church. Instead of doing what God asked, clean this planet up and invite me back to receive you home. Hello? Now, I know he's coming back anyway, but I want to know that he's coming back. I'm at least inviting him back. I'm a citizen of this planet. I asked God to come. He's here. Can you say amen? Yeah. All right. So everyone say we have power. So, so far, I've only done three, didn't I? Now we're going to go to the word dunamis. It's the word we get dynamite. It's explosive power. You have the ability to explode power on the scene, and you shall receive dunamis, the power to explode God's presence on the scene. Can you say amen? Now, certainly, you and I should get emboldened about that news. But unless we use that power, it's still there, but it's in operable because it's designed for us in Jesus Christ to operate. So exousia, dunamis, iscus, kratos, and there's one more. I'm trying to remember which one it is. It's okay. And the other one literally means, well, we'll just let it go. It literally means that you are the reason God hasn't destroyed this planet. Hello? The church. Whose church is it? That's right. Whose children are you? And, and, and God doesn't take lightly of the, of the enemy messing with you. So he, here's what the enemy does. See, he messes with us when we are lusting, when we're in the flesh. So actually, we're causing it. Listen to me carefully. God's not allowing it. We're causing it, and because we have a will, Satan knows that, and our will is interjected, we're just going to go do what we want to do. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. A lot of Christians, please, maybe some of our children are compromised. They're, they're trying to mix the world with Jesus and Jesus with the world, and it's shorting them out. So their lives, they get beat on too much. We don't, our, we don't want our children beat on. We don't want our children lost. We don't want our family lost, do we? And so, really, we need to know the powers of God, and we need to interact in them. Say amen. amen. And then influence. Everyone say influence. We have God's influence. That means when you learn to release God in your heart, you should do that every morning. Practice releasing God out in front of you. Releasing the love of God, the joy of God. Releasing the things of God's spirit out in front of you. Project it, okay? All right. When you do that, God's influence goes out and touches people. It's interesting that if you get up that way and you begin to practice that way, which we really are supposed to be doing, you know, it's what's required of us to have a good walk. But if we're not doing that, you're going to not have a good walk. Please don't blame God. You know, it's our lack of something. But when we're doing that, you're the one that goes to the store and you get all the deals. The lights turn green while you're in a hurry. And you go, thank you, Lord. In other words, the favor and influence of God begins to work mightily. Why? Because God lives in us. And if we nurture you and lift Christ up, what did Jesus say? If I be lifted up, what? I will draw all men nigh unto me. So you have God in here, lift him up, project him forward, and God will give you his influence and favor. It's, it's in his word. Hello? So you can claim that, you can walk in that, but you need to ask the Holy Spirit to te help teach us those ways because sometimes we're not as good as enacting those ways as we think we are sometimes we think a little more highly than we are my job is not to correct you my job is to pray for you give you to God God's job is to correct you if I have a word for you it will have three things in for it it will have exhortation comfort and edification 
It will build you up, it will comfort you, but also it will correct and instruct you. So you hear a word of God come out of me and will say, thus saith the Lord, in days past you have been having a hard time, but right now I have changed that. In the days to come, you see, so prophecy has all of God's fingerprints in it. So if anybody tries to prophesy or say something, if there's not love, if there's not exhortation, if it doesn't comfort you, spit it out. Hello, throw it away. Another thing about prophecy, if somebody gives you a word, if I give you a word and God hasn't already told you that, then I'm off the wall. I missed it. You know, we can miss it. I'm not afraid of missing it. I'm, I'm just afraid of not wanting to learn. I don't want to ever get to that place where I think I know it all. Anyway, if I come to you and I say, sell your dog and move to Alaska, you know that's not from God. Number one, Pastor Carrie, I don't own a dog. And then the charismatics will come in. Well, maybe it has to do with your future. Oh, God, help me. <laughs> you see, there are people that think that's spiritual. No, that's meddling. Don't do it. God doesn't want his children meddled with. He wants them educated, blessed, lifted up. Can you say amen? And that means every human being has a right to be saved. So therefore, we don't need to criticize another human being. Oh, there's plenty to criticize. But the criticism itself is dangerous, not what we say about it. It's dangerous in, because it opens the door to the enemy lacing your head with bad stuff. Everyone say, not me. Not me. All right, so let's look at our scripture. God builds his kingdom in us. All right, this is Hebrews chapter 3, 3 through 6, and I will stop and explain it, but necessary. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Who is he talking about? The one is Jesus. Now, the story is talking about the glory of the two covenants. The Old Testament was glorious, was of God. But the problem with the Old Testament was mankind was flawed. So God had to come up with a way that the covenant could be set without mankind messing it up. Can you say amen? And he did through Jesus Christ. So this one, Jesus, has been counted worthy more than the glory of Moses, insomuch that he who built the house has much more honor than the house. Can you say amen? amen. For every house is built by someone, but he who builds all things is who? Now, we're teaching about building the kingdom, but the house of God, which house you are, and the kingdom of God dwells in that house, which you have the kingdom. And that New Testament kingdom is tremendously more powerful, so we need to be educated on what we have. So in verse 5, and Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for our testimony of those things which should be spoken afterward. Verse 6, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house, what? We are if we hold fast to the confidence, consistency, and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Do you see it? The house of God is the New Testament covenant. You are the temple of God. Another word for that is a house. God told the people in the Old Testament, there's coming a time where I'm going to come and dwell in the earth again. I'm going to be with my people. They're going to be with me, and I'm going to dwell in their heart, and I'm going to write my law in their mind and in their heart, and no man need to really teach them because I who dwell in them will teach them. Now, I just quoted what it says in Ezekiel, but also it's confirmed in 1 John chapter 2, verses 20 and verse 27. You have an anointing of the Holy One, and you have no need that anyone have to instruct you. But whatever you, wherever you are, God the instructor lives in you and will show you what he wants you to know if we listen to him. Everyone say, if I listen to him. There's a lot of information coming our way, isn't there? Well, we need God to be the filter. Let me say this to you. God wants me to say it right now. You see, the Bible is our, our book, our blueprint. 
It's our manual. Can you say amen? It has an Old Testament and a New Testament. So let me just generally say this. It gives us God's will for mankind, doesn't it? But it's a general description of God's will. You and I need specifics. We know not to steal, but we need a, a specific on how God, and so the specific, the, the specific instructions to us, not the general, comes by the Holy Spirit. For example, let's say I need to minister to Scott. The Bible says I can lay hands on him, I could do the general knowledge of the word. But I need specific instructions from the Holy Spirit to minister to him personally. So don't be just like an average Christian and have our, that's okay. Don't be just an average Christian and have a general knowledge of the word. Let me encourage you, that's okay. Let's put it on the mic and everybody can laugh with you. Hi, Ohio. Hi, Montana. Hi, California. We've got, yeah, the word. Da, 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 da. Anyway, I almost lost my train of thought. So. It's not your fault. Hey, oh, gosh, gosh. Probably God calling, interrupting me. Amen. Now, where was I? We were talking about mankind, their sensitivity, right? Okay, we have the general instructions, Old New Testament, and it tells us, even go, t tells us the heart of Christ, the Ten Commandments, it's the heart of Christ, but nobody can keep them without the Holy Spirit. So we need the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit resists the proud, but gives grace and instruction to the Humble yourself in the side of, so we meet with God, humble ourselves, and we don't become abrasive or agitated because it will push the Holy Spirit, which we need every day, away from us. I didn't know I could do that. Yeah. Yeah. You want to feel what that sounds like? Let's do an experiment together. Now, this is just a silly experiment, but I want you to feel how the Holy Spirit works. I want you to say, bless Pastor Kerry. Now say this, you, I'm not, you're not going to mean it. It says, punch him, Lord. You see the, the crunch of the spirit, how it goes like that? Because it goes against the grain. I use the illustration. God said it would be okay. But see, when we ever start coming against things, we're not operating in the flow. Can you say amen? All right, let's get into this. If you're going to have a successful Christian walk, and we all should, then I want you to note this. The key to a successful walk with Christ is to start out each day presenting yourselves before God. So can I have an amen? amen? Asking him to crucify our flesh, anoint us for the day, throughout the day, so we can listen, be thankful, and to practice what he tells us. That's how to have a successful walk. It's no harder than that. Say amen. Well, why is my walk so hard? When's the last time you spent a good time in prayer? When's the last time you asked God to cleanse you from all of you? You know, so there are things that if you keep maintaining it, it's easy maintenance. I like easy maintenance in my car. That means I change the oil, make sure everything's tuned up and everything so that everything don't collect up and become a disaster when I have to go into the shop. So every day you go into the shop and meet with the mechanic and let him adjust you and do all you'll have a successful walk and I most of you are doing that now you got tired of me saying it and you started doing it <laughs> I had people come unglued you're telling me to pray I pray enough do you well look right there <laughs> anyway let's go on we're going to cover these four areas number one God builds his house and his kingdom we do not God builds his house in kingdom. Number two, what God builds, he backs, and it lasts forever. Whatever is born of God overcometh the world. Your visions, your hopes, your dreams that he's given you are all powered to bring you through life if you follow Christ. Amen? Thirdly, it's through consistency that the kingdom is built 
correctly. You see, we are like trees. We grow in four areas. Everyone say four. You know, you know, four square. We grow in four ways. We grow in depth, length, breadth, and height. Everyone say, I got it. No. Breadth means character. You're quite the character. You're an original. Can you say amen? Let God bring out the goodness of your character and flesh the other way. Can you say amen? So breath is character. What you do with or when you're off by yourself shows the character of where you're at with God. And then length. Length's endurance. We grow in endurance. How many here know you can believe a little bit more today than you could when you first got, you know? And you're enduring and learning. Amen. And then there's height, right? Width, length, height, spirituality. You're growing up into the Lord, okay? And then depth. What do you think depth's around? Your roots, your stability. So as a Christian, we grow in those four areas, width, breadth, height, and depth. Can you say amen? And the Bible says we go through four seasons. To every... Something or other, there is a season. I don't know how it goes. I love it. Turn, turn, turn. Anyway, so I notice how God took that song out of me. Anyway, there's what we call spring. What happens in spring? Things begin to grow and bloom and everything. And then there's a summer producing fruit and everything. And then what after summer, what happens? Fall. I use the word autumn because nobody likes to fall. Joking. Okay, Paul, what happens? And in winter, let me tell you, Christians, you go through a springtime through cycles. It does, your spring could be quick or it could be slow, and you're enjoying all that, and suddenly you move into summer, now you're producing fruit. Wow, this is great! Everything's great, and all of a sudden it goes quiet. Did I do something wrong? Did I, did I grieve you, God? No, I'm rerouting the inner part of you so you'll produce more fruit. So fall is when we begin to introvert and we get close to God. Now, I'll explain in a minute. I'm not talking about our fall. I'm talking about our season as a believer. So we have fall times where God wants us to introvert, to recontemplate things, to make sure that we're doing it and we're not slipping, doing something. And then we go into winter. Winter's dormant time. In winter time for a Christian, and it doesn't have to be very long at all, it's where all the seed resets itself. So you got everything shutting down in autumn, but then in winter time, everything is dormant outwardly, but is moving on the inside. And God is making all those adjustments in you. So when it, what's happening? Spring is coming. So God moves us through the cycles to build character, to build height and depth. Hello? And to produce fruit. And you'll go, and if you get a chance, I think it's Isaiah 61, but maybe 66. He says, we are the trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord. So see what I just explained, that God, we're more than trees, but we grow like a tree. Now, there are Christians who won't discipline themselves, and so they'll be highly developed in one area of their life, but another area of their life, they're not developed at all. They could be really good at love, but they're very bad at controlling their self. So they're overweight or everything's out of order. So what we need to do is we need God to take care of all four of those areas of our life. The depth, the width, the height, every time we meet with him. He makes adjustments. So we grow wholesome. We grow complete. Say amen, somebody. Don't lose me here because there's a lot of lopsided Christians. They're still bound by their fear, still being led by other things, and they're not developing and becoming whole. God brought us into a sanctuary in it before his feet so he could cause us to be complete and whole. 
that we may grow up into him who's the head of all principality power. Are you excited as I am? So let's get into this. Now, did I hit the fourth thing? Being built up a spiritual house, let God build it, not you. Okay. All right. God builds his house and kingdom. Go with me to Psalms 127, verse 1. I like what Isaiah 62, you just go to that scripture. I think it's Isaiah 66, 1, says, the, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house are you going to build me? He, he, God is actually, he's, he, he's not, he's confronting mankind, remember? We could do it, God. We could do it. And God says, look, I made the heavens, I made the earth, what are you going to do for me? The idea is he's talking to the Jewish people who have got a big problem with pride. How many here know we're not building our house? God is. How many here know now that he is really good at building your life and putting it back together? He restores what the canker worm and what the caterpillar has destroyed, Joel chapter 2, and restoring what we, through our life and bad decisions and such, have tore down. And if we continually go as we're going, he will rebuild your head, rebuild the king menu, show you how to operate in it, and then walk with you through it. Now, to me, that's a real out of sight, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, I haven't heard that word in a long time. All right. So unless the Lord builds the house, verse 1, they that labor, labor in vain who build it. And unless the Lord guards the city, here you go, all those are praying for the cities, the watchman stays awake in vain. Everybody here know what a watchman is? Some may not. Anybody don't know what a watchman is? That's a prayer warrior back in the day, they would stick watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem to watch out for the enemy and anything coming. But they also watched out for the people, make sure there weren't no riots or all that. So a watchman is a prayer warrior, an intercessor. Their job is to pray. God has chosen me to pray over Montana. We're talking about Sheridan and Ennis and all that area, Twin Bridges and stuff, sort of a watchman. Now, does that mean I'm going to go in there all the time and do stuff? No. I'm in there every day in prayer as a watchman. And God alerts me if there's something I need to pray about. Isn't that cool? That's what God wants you to do. But it, I'll be watching in vain if I don't, we don't let God run the city. We don't let God run this church. He's running this church. He's actually building this church. So that's why people get in trouble when they come against it. You can't come against God. Now, there's a lot of churches being built by God, but there's some built, being built by man. And God's got his hands full. Paul says, oh, pray for me that I don't be too concerned about all the churches God gave me to plant. So he goes on. A couple of points. Jesus is the author and the finisher of whose faith? Ours. We're to look to him, aren't we? We must come to Jesus and learn his ways. Jesus said, come unto me, all you are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from, he said, learn from me. So you got him in here. Learn from in here, not from here. You got a lot of stuff you think you know already up there, and some of it's tainted. Hello, God, I wash it away. Come on. All right. Two, the more exposure to God, as a pastor, I can encourage you to, and all of us, the more exposure to God, the more Jesus is able to lay the foundation under our feet. Now, remember, this is a unique foundation because it isn't just bricks and mortar. It's a rock, and it's a living rock. His name is Jesus. So wherever you go, that rock's under your feet. Can you say amen? And the more you praise him, the more you get in the word, the more you just get excited and stay in the realm of your hedge, the larger the rock gets. There's one thing if I'm standing on a, a little baseball rock, 
baby Christians after they, they don't know to pray and get in the Word. They're trying to walk like that. No, we're, li we're, st we're standing on the rock of Gibraltar. It's huge. And it moves right under our feet as we move in the Spirit. Can you say amen? Now, nobody would ever teach you that except for me and God who teaches them. You have a living foundation that moves under your feet because his name is Jesus. Not only moves under your feet, he moves in your heart. He moves with you. He orders our steps. Wow! <laughs> I can't help but get up now in the morning and just smile. Doesn't matter what's going on. You have a partnership with Almighty God. The third thing I want to share with you is we cannot do this, build a kingdom or build our house by ourselves. We have to have God, blueprint and instruction. Say amen. Okay. And we have to be a doer of the word. Okay. All right. Go with me to Isaiah 55, please. We're going to look at 10 and 11. It's talking about the word, how it comes down in the earth like snow and water, and it waters the earth and everything, and it gives seed to the sower, it causes the seed to grow and everything. God wants us to know his word, but to share his word. Next week, I have a great sermon God gave me, but I don't have the piece of equipment yet. I'm going to get it this week for this illustration. And so I'm excited because you are just beginning to realize like I am, that God has opened the heavens. It says, come on, kids, let me show you. I want to show you what that really means. Would you like to see what I have for you? I'm the one who holds your future, but you got to get with me so I can share it with you. Yeah! When you look with your relationship with God, it's exciting. You're excited to be with your father. Man, the heavens just open up! I'll celebrate that. <laughs> so it says in 5510, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and, and does not return, return there, but waters the earth and make it bring forth the bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void without accomplishing things, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the, in the thing where I've sent it. Everyone say, I'm the thing he sent the word. See, so the sower soweth the word. God's building his word of his kingdom in our heart. As we act, as we hear, as we act, as we act, as we hear, here we act, that foundation and that entire life in us is being built up spiritually. Can you say amen? So what does the enemy do? He just keeps us busy. You're too busy, you can't pray. I know that's not the case anymore. You're too busy, can't get in the word. See, if you don't have the word before your eyes, you have nothing but the Holy Spirit to give you a surprise. Instead, you assume that we know, and so we just act that way, and we, we get in a rut. No, every day is a fresh day for revelation about his way, not our own. Can you say amen? All right, so it shall accomplish in us. So the word's got to get in us. Amen. God is speaking. I'm speaking. The word is going out. Amen. And here you're sitting on the couch watching your phone. And God is speaking. Listen, the Bible tells us, don't be the kind of individual, and I'm, I'm being graceful, that think you know it and that will not listen to the voice of God. Because when you do, you will shake, rattle, and roll, and it won't be good. Hebrews chapter 12 says, we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Our kingdom is trashed, but we live in his kingdom. All right, let's go to the second point. Yeah, second. My goodness, Gary. You are getting some out of this, aren't you? Yeah. What God builds, he backs 
and it lasts forever. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 10 through 17, I'm going to read rather quickly. According to the grace of God which was given to me, this is Paul speaking, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, Jesus, another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on Jesus, on it. For no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, and that is Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? If any man work that he built on endures, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. Now, it talks about six items, wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stone. Just about your spirit and your flesh, spirit and flesh. How many know the wood, hay, and the, the, the stubble is flesh? Can you say amen? Amen. And how many know that's going to burn up? Okay, so don't try to live in your flesh so much. You can have much more fun in your spirit and get a better buzz with God. I'm telling you. And I've been buzzed. I don't like hugging the porcelain God. I like to be buzzed in God. You know, I'm full of God. Having God share with me some of the things I'm going to share with you today. Man, it's good. It's wonderful. Don't stop. Keep yeah. going. Yeah. All right. So this is, man, listen to this. Okay. But let each one take heed how he builds on. Now, okay. So verse 16, do you not know that you are the temple or house of God? Say amen. Now I'm going to teach a little bit here. First of all, when God builds this house, whose house is it? So if anybody comes against you and God is building his house in you, they're in trouble. So don't fight back. What? Don't rebuttal. Don't argue. Don't fight back. Just simply say, you know, I see you have a problem with me, but you know what? God loves you. And let's leave it at that. Because you can't attack the house without getting slapped. And if you say anything more, God will have to do you both. We want to be smart. Somebody's upset at us, let them be upset. Don't interchange and get into it. Say, okay, let's talk about it. I'm all ears. All right, moving on. Watch this. He says, do not know that you are the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple or the house of God, God will destroy him. Now, see, what you don't know is this. We need to get this in context. Are you telling me if I do things wrong, God's just going to wipe me out? No, that's not what it's saying. Read it in the Amplified and some of the other translations. It brings it out. It says when God has a church like this, where everybody's seeking God, and somebody comes in and starts attacking it, tries to destroy it, God will destroy them. He's talking about the antibody. You know, in your body, you have an antibody. Go ahead and get a sliver in your finger. The antibody attack that sliver, and it begins festered, and it's supposed to, the infection is supposed to drive that sliver out, right? When you get somebody come in and start up problems, and the antibody, God, will really come after them. That's why it says when you've got a brother or sister, this is this church discipline. Don't get over up and said about it. nobody's in trouble here okay but when somebody causes that the Holy Spirit puts them off by themselves and it says to us don't keep them company so they may be ashamed that they're hurting God's body hello Amen. don't fellowship with somebody who has no respect for government no respect for church authorities no respect for what God is doing in their life they just always complaining always doing it you're not supposed to even be hanging around them yeah. and folks why is it us tough Christians why aren't we changing the world instead of the world changing us yeah. all these Christians went to save the Jews to lead them to Christ and the Jews converted the Christians Something wrong with dad. Listen, don't re represent God if you're totally ignorant of who he is. You learn first. 
Don't say, I come in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, oh. Are you with me? Come on, I love you. I, I'm not, I, again, I'm not preaching that. I'm just sharing what the foolishness that, that sometimes we get caught up in. It goes on. All right. So this is the day will declare our work. What day will declare what you've done in your life? What day is it that we go before God and we have to give an account of our life? What do we call that? Judgment day. Now, there's a difference. The people that never accept Jesus, they have a different judgment day. You're not going to be there. You're going to be in the judgment seat of Christ, whereby we give an account. Now, listen carefully. I'm not trying. This is, this is for your education. All the things that you should have done or could have done and you didn't do, Jesus will wipe away. Those are your hay, sticks, and stubble. The things you did do, but maybe you didn't do really good, but you did do them, those are your gold, silver, and precious stone. So what we do unto God for the love of people is always remains. What we do for the love of ourself to be noticed by people always burns up. Hello? I'm not a man pleaser. I want to be a God pleaser. Don't want to be a man pleaser. I just want to let my life respect him. Don't want to be a man pleaser. You see? Now, we're not pleasing man, but we are loving one another. Can you say amen? So, we want our work to last. So that foundation, remember, when God builds it, it will last. He backs it. Say amen. I want him to build my life up and not me myself. You made that? Yeah, isn't it awful? <laughs> amen. couple of points. Number one, knowing our covenant with God and knowing God backs that covenant above even his name, nothing can defeat or break and tear down that covenant and the hedge that God has put around us. Only you and I can do that. So let's say I got a really mighty hedge about me, which means the enemy can't trespass until I open my mouth and say, you know that sherry over there? Well, there's two sherries over there. I got a bean to pick. Next thing I'm doing, I'm hacking away from the inside my protection. Why well, haven't Christians learned to get a hold of this? Yeah. Big trouble here. Big trouble. James calls it a little fire that'll burn the whole forest. You get somebody upset, have you ever heard them say things they wish they never did? Moving right along. Two, we work with God, not for God. Let me say it again. We work with God, not for God. Working for God is a noble thing, but to have no God energy, we work with God for God. Can you say amen? We work with God for God, and the rewards are out of this world. Christ's mutual life. Thirdly, let us not try to build our own life. It fails. I know wonderful ministers, wonderful ministers that die before their time. Something happened because part of their house that God was building was missing a wall or a roof. They wanted to get into the faith and, and the power of God, but they didn't want anything to do but self-discipline. So they got a gaping hole in their life that Satan every once in a while can visit and destroy their life with. Hello? We want every one of our entire building that God's building totally covered, totally protected, totally Bless, can you say amen? Yeah. That's because we have to allow him to build it. Now, whatever God builds lasts and lasts and lasts. So I think you already know the answer. Let's not do it ourselves. James chapter 1, 21 through 25 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness, overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. But be doers of the word, and not just hearers only, deceiving ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, but not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face. 
and quickly goes away and forgets what manner of man he was. Let me explain. You're spiritual now. You're a God child. Can you say amen? But if all you do is look in the natural at things, you'll soon forget the spirituality that we have. We'll slip right back into reasoning and try to do things ourselves. Causes great frustration in your own walk. We don't want to do that. We want to look into the perfect law of liberty, which is the word of God, and we want to continue in consistency. And it says that will cause us not to be a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man or woman is blessed in what they do. That's James, the half-brother of Jesus. Wow. Wow. Book of James is the Proverbs of the New Testament. You get a chance to read it. He gives things that are so beyond what the normal was given. But you really got to sit down and, and really let the Holy Spirit open your eyes to the book of James. It's written in a mindset of Jewish background, but it's written in a way in which the Holy Spirit will show you the beauty, the, the, the treasures that are in it. Remember, it's not by our own looking at the word, but by the spirit God reveals. Can you say amen? amen? All right, so let's go to our next point. It's through consistency that the kingdom is built. Go with him, Matthew chapter 4, please. I'll try to buzz along here. Verse 23. And Jesus went about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Preaching the gospel of the what? Remember, bringing the kingdom before man so they could touch him, see him, smell him, watch him work within the people. He's showing the kingdom. How does the kingdom operate? Well, let's continue to watch Jesus here. Okay. And it says, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all kinds of sicknesses, all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went out throughout Syria, and they brought to him all sick people, those who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Hello. What healed them? The anointing in Christ's life. The fact that he brought the kingdom. Now, remember the Lord's Prayer? Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Father, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. You have the kingdom in you. So you have the right to lay hands on the sick. Jesus will heal them. You have the hand, Jesus has the healing. You hold the stick, God does the rest. Hello? Be it done on earth. And so God wants you to say, hey, hey kids, you see how the earth is operating? They're sick. You have my kingdom. Now, are you going to keep that all to yourself? When my pastor told me that, I mean, I was all but three weeks old in the Lord, I started looking for sick people. I hear somebody sneeze, do you need prayer? My cousin used to make fun of me. But unless you're eager to get after what God wants you to do, you're going to sit around and wonder if you should have, could have, or would have. Get busy. Enjoy some of the benefits of what God does in your heart by obeying him simply like a child. Woo, glory to God. Let's get on with this. So it says, now listen, fame went out. He healed all these people. He showed them the kingdom. You got an example of that. The key to understanding these results of what Jesus did is that he through the Father and the anointing did them. Not because he was just Jesus. We always say, well, I was Jesus. That was Jesus. Well, read the scripture with me. It's John 14, verse 12. Everyone? It says, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, how many here believe in him? The works that I do shall he do also, and even greater works than I do, because I go to the Father. So Jesus is at the right of the hand of the Father. We have God in our heart. And see, here's the key. We're not letting God out to do what God does. We're trying to get God to do what he said I did. So when I used to pray for the sick, I used to try to get them healed, you know, and doing all that kind of stuff. God says, no, just release me. I'm the one who heals them. Now when I pray for the sick, God gives me a readout. Now, I haven't done a lot of altar calls right now, so I'm trying to get the body of Christ in a condition to receive miracle, miracles and new people coming. We have to get positioned, mature, and stop fighting amongst ourselves. Hello. Making those little gestures. Come on. Now, God is in us. Remember the third chapter of Acts, where Peter and John come up to the gate of beautiful was right in front of the temple and there was a man begging he'd been there all every day begging 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 and now the kingdom is within John and Peter and of course Peter says silver and gold we don't have don't look at the outward man but what I do have I'm going to give you that's the key we're not giving out ourselves. <laughs> I'm not giving out my charm because I don't have much. I'm giving out God. In fact, I, I'm going to say this kind of humbly, but when I speak God, you can feel coming out. That's how you tell the anointing is working and where that's good. Because you can go to a meeting, go to some of these great speakers, and you can sense God speaking coming out. That's what you want to look for. If you've got a pastor that doesn't happen with, leave the church and go where it does no I'm not, I'm not advocating leaving churches I'm just saying you need to be praying for that pastor praying for those people you got it say amen, amen. and finishing building up the kingdom and the spiritual house go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 and we'll use that as the last scripture God is building his kingdom and is building his house so let me explain. When did the kingdom spiritually come? The day of Pentecost. It came like never before. It filled the whole atmosphere of the earth and like a great sound of a mighty rushing wind. So God just filled the vacuum that was here, left here by man's sin and Satan, and he filled it. Now, listen carefully. The atmosphere that you and I breathe is filled with God. What, what's, what, how, how come some people don't get it? Some people do. Because you can't get something you're not aware of. You can't open up to something you don't know is there. Yeah. It's in the, ab God is in the atmosphere you breathe. And now we're starting to hear songs. Here's the air I breathe. Hello? Knowing this, when we start speaking the word and start telling people about God, the power of God that's in the atmosphere switches to like a do and starts clamming to you. We call it the anointing. So the more you talk about God, the more you love God. I mean, within reason. You can't do it always on the job. And love God, the, the God in the very air you breathe starts laminating on you and rising up on the inside of you. And there you'll understand where two or three are gathered in my name. There am I in their midst to do something supernatural. I'm amazed at how many people come to church. They're not expecting to receive anything but a lunch afterwards. You should be drooling for God. As a deer panteth out the water, so my soul longeth after you. You alone make my heart desire, and I long to worship you. See, he created us for that reason. 
And when we lavish on him, and when we do that, and we open up to him, he lavishes on us. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Okay. 1 Peter 2, 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, you know what being malicious is? You think somebody's mad at you, so you do some malicious thing at them. All deceit, don't lie to anybody. Hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Say amen. And if you indeed have tasted the Lord is gracious, let me see the hands of those. Okay. Coming to him as a lively stone, rejected indeed by men, the Jews hated him, but chosen by God and precious. You also as a living stone are being built up a spiritual house, a kingdom inside of you, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it also is contained in scripture, behold, I lay in Zion, I lay in Zion. For a foundation of stone, I lay in Zion. For a foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, a sure foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. He that believeth shall not make haste. Talking about, never mind. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, the day of Pentecost, the kingdom came spiritually, but now as we get in the word, hear the word, as we walk with God, the kingdom is being built in us. Now we got a kingdom in us and a kingdom around us. We cannot become against. The problem is the kingdom within us is being built. It takes a little while. But the kingdom around us, it's totally established. So when the kingdom is being built in us, we act, we talk, we move within the kingdom, and God is established. Can you say amen? I don't know about you, but you are very blessed people. Find someone today you can bless. Find someone today you can encourage. Find one someone today maybe that is broken and that you can maybe minister to their hearts. Remember, already people are curious about your walk. So let them become very curious to the God that lives in your heart. Let's give the Lord praise, will you? Thank you. For